Hello, welcome to this session hosted by Product School. Hope all of you are well and safe. My name is Victor, and I'm a senior product manager at Farfetch, the global platform for the luxury industry. Today, we're going to talk about mental models and how can you use them in your product roles to boost your professional career. So let's have a look at the sections that we will cover today. To be honest, uh, I didn't hear about mental models one year ago. Uh, so they were a complete stranger to me at that time. And I think that they are still a complete stranger to most of the product people. So the first thing we're going to do today is to ensure that all of us understand this concept well. And then we're going to jump into why do I think that they can be a critical asset in your product career. Lastly, we will go through some examples on how can we apply them in our day-to-day -day roles. And I believe we're going to have some space for questions at the end of the, of the presentation. So if everyone's ready, let's start diving into the mental model world. And first of all, I wanted to present myself. And to present myself, I thought that it would be good to share a rather personal story. I started my product career in Telefonica three years ago. And this is a telco company with presence mainly in Europe and South America. And there we were building MarTech and AdTech products. And in the beginning of the last year, I decided to join Farfetch. I joined the company in April, and you can imagine that starting a new job amidst the pandemic was quite a challenge and not an easy experience. And I feel that for sure, most of you uh, have struggled a bit or at least uh, experienced some, some pain points or not an easy experience last year as well with the pandemic, right? So as in every new job, I wanted to onboard to the products and challenges of the role and to provide a positive impact to the business as soon as possible to prove my value. However, this was proving to be harder than in a normal setting as by working uh, remotely, I didn't have access to the team on not a daily basis, of course, a daily basis, but it was not as, as, a, as a closer relationship as it would have been in the office, right? So at that time, I was in need of tools and frameworks to help me mainly with two things. This was understanding complex situations fast and the second part was be comfortable with taking decisions in new product environments. So I started researching online and I came across mental models, which were very helpful and proved to be of great help for my new product role. So that's why I would like to share what I learned about them and why I think they can be a critical asset in your product career. So let's just start with the first thing first. Uh, what are really mental models? I guess most of you recognize a gentleman in the left side of the picture. He's Warren Buffett, American investor and philanthropist, uh, having Berkshire Hathaway. His company has achieved an outstanding 20.5% return investment since 1965, and hence why he's a very well-known businessman. But you might not know the chap that is next to him. He's Charlie Munger. He's Warren Buffett's uh, lifelong partner. And he was one of the first people to mention the mental models concept in a speech, in this case at Marshall Business School in 1994. So as you can read in the slide, and I'm reading same as you're doing, uh, he mentioned, what is elementary worldly wisdom? Well, the first rule is that you can't really know anything if you just remember isolated facts and try and bang them back. You've got to have models in your head. And you've got to array your experience, both vicarious and direct, on this latest work of models. I think this is a rather relevant, relevant quote, uh, since as the saying goes, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Meaning that you can identify a specific situation and relate it to past experiences or to learnings, and then apply a set of actions from that experience that will help you know what to do. So if we try to break this down, at the end, what we are considering is that we are taking past experiences and learnings and relating them to a mental model. Let's take an example to see if we're really understanding this concept. So I'm sure that in your day-to-day -day jobs or roles, you're exposed to certain situations which remind you of past experiences. An example could be optimizing the checkout process for an e-commerce for those of us that we are exposed to e-commerce settings, for instance, no? Then out of a sudden, you remember the situation you experienced and the actions you took when you experienced for the first time the situation of uh, optimizing a checkout process. And you leverage those learnings for this new situation. So 
with that, what you're doing is in fact leveraging the past experience as a mental model to know how to act in future situations. That's simply put, a mental model you learned in the past, which you are now leveraging to optimize your decision making. If you can identify a mental model that applies to the situation in front of you, then you immediately know a lot about that situation. You are not alone anymore. You have your thoughts from the past experience with you, and then you can optimize this. So let's try to just uh, describe it in a few words. No? We could define the concept as creating a mental model of a situation, which becomes then a model that you can later apply in similar situations, as we just discussed with, with this example. No? And it's very important to highlight here that it's critical that you're exposed to a wide array of disciplines to capture as many mental models as possible. Um, this is a very relevant uh, sentence we got also from Charlie Munger. He believes that knowledge is uh, not only limited to uh, an array of disciplines or to a discipline, to a room, to a company. So you have to be learning about new stuff every day if you can and be exposed to uh, as a wide array of situations as possible. And at the end, this framework can open up the ability to think better about the world, uh, what some experts call the super thinking. No? Uh, I will mention a book later on that uh, is called Super Thinking, I believe, and in fact is is helping you in, in that direction of achieving like a greater thinking capacity. No? The good news is that you can use this ability to your advantage, not only in professional, but also in personal settings. And we're going to touch on a couple of examples later on, which illustrate this a bit better. But I think that this is one of those tools that does not only provide a positive return on your time investment in your professional experience, but also in your personal life, you can see how you can benefit for from this kind of, of procedures. No? So again, taking a look at a couple of examples that I think some of them will be relevant in, in your past experience. Uh, and noting first that mental models are organized by topics. So you will see this a lot. If you research online about these, these frameworks, you will see that they're organized by different topics. In this case, I choose two topics that I think are quite relevant for product roles. Uh, the first one is de-risking. So the risking at the end, uh, as you might know, is when you have a certain situation in a product development environment or in general in any situation where it's quite risky, the percentage of risk is quite high. What you want to do is take some actions that take out the risk from the situation, right? So here we find a popular model called MVP or minimum viable product, as I'm sure most of you already know. So this is an approach that it's widely used in, in product development processes to test the product hypothesis fast before having the fully functional product out in the market. No? Uh, what, what you do at the end is identify what are the minimum versions of the features describing the product and then focus on building those to validate your hypothesis. What is disruptive about this? Not much for us as product managers, right? We're currently using it for sure in your day-to-day -day jobs. I think what can be a bit disruptive about this model is using it outside of your professional setting. So you could use this model in situations outside of product development, uh, such as testing a new organizational structure, even inside a professional setting, or even uh, in, your in your personal life. No? For instance, uh, a fun example here is that a couple of years ago, me and my, some of my friends we wanted to get into road cycling. It's quite an expensive hobby. Uh, so we thought, okay, how can we de-risk this? How can we take some step to validate that this is really what we would like to do? So we rented a road cycling instead of buying one uh, altogether. Then we tried to uh, ask for some uh, gear from some friends. So we were trying to test the hypothesis of how does it feel to go out and road cycle for a bit before doing the investment of buying all the gear. No? So that's an example of how could you use it in your personal life. Then. You also have uh, some other examples. Now here I'm listing another one uh, in the remit of trying to deal with conflict. I think dealing with conflict, it's not something that uh, you see only in your organization or the organization I'm part of. It's common to, to all the situations that we deal in product management in general or, or in any company. You know? And conflict doesn't have to be negative per se. I think there are some conflicting ideas that are positive for the business overall that you need to um, reach a consensus to as a team. You know? So uh, for this example of dealing with conflict, in my experience, uh, this has been one of the most useful mental models. It's called decision logs uh, and consists of collaboratively listing the different options to consider in a specific decision making setting. So for instance, if you want to decide if a certain feature has to be launched, what you could do is try to think of the different scenarios or different options. And in a document, you list those options 
and you also try to input all the information that you think is needed for someone that is uh, an outsider to that decision to understand what's happening in a kind of a one pager. Once it's ready, what you do is that you share this, you share it with your team, seeking to get further comments from the team and seeking to get everyone's opinion on the merger. And then what you do is review everyone's opinion, everyone's comments and reach a consensus as a team. I think what is important is that it's not only a good tool to reach consensus, it's also a very good tool to, for future reference, to understand why you took some decisions in the past uh, that might help uh, and guide some of the decisions in the future. No? So as you can see, and maybe you're feeling this already, uh, some of these mental models can feel rather basic and common sense. Uh, it's okay to feel like that. I, I, I feel like that as well sometimes. I think some of the most breakthrough uh, mental models are rather basic, but are breakthrough when you really apply them on your day-to-day -day life. No? For instance, decision logs, something that can feel really basic, but at the end, if you apply them on your daily jobs, you will see the benefits of, of really getting to the details of using and reaching consensus with, with your team altogether. Now that uh, we have defined uh, mental models, I wanted to also reflect a bit on why I think they're important uh, for you, uh, and especially for you guys as, as uh, people interested in, in product management. No? So some of you might be familiar with this scene uh, I took uh, in this picture from the Mad Men series. This is Don Draper. Uh, he's an award-winning advertising executive of the 50s. It's fiction. Some people argue that it's science fiction. Uh, and something you see throughout the series is how Don meets the new customers who tell him about their challenges, seeking for advice, uh, and for a new advertising campaign. No? So in each meeting, Don has a very limited time to understand what are the pain points the client is experiencing, and then to identify in the same meeting, maybe one hour meeting, the best ad that his agency could run for this client to then win the account, no? And you could feel that Don is starting from scratch every time he's meeting a new client, no? So there are some scenes that are super iconic, like when he's meeting Lucky Strike or Coke, et cetera. And you could feel like when he meets the first time, with a, for the first time uh, Lucky Strike, he's starting from scratch. But he's not. Uh, what he's doing is rather uh, leveraging mental models. Uh, and he might not know that, but uh, to do what he's doing and to be as successful as he is, uh, he observes, first of all, what the client is telling him. And then he's seeking to identify these past experiences and learnings and then leverages this to pitch a solution to the client. No? So he's doing this observation, identification of actions, of things that he did in the past. And then he's leveraging these past experiences, mental models to pitch a new solution to the client. No? So, I think overall product management and in general, your roles uh, might not differ uh, that much from Don's role. Uh, you're constantly exposed to new challenges where you have to observe the information at your disposal. Then you have to identify the past experiences or learnings that might be helping you in that situation and then leverage them to know how to act accordingly. So the more knowledgeable you are about mental models, the more tools you will have at your disposal to face any type of challenge. And that's why I think they are a very relevant tool for you to know and to leverage in your product career. Now that we know about them and we know what they, why they are super relevant, in my opinion, uh, I want to touch a bit on how can you use them, no? And as I said before, there are endless mental models at your disposal, but to me, the most relevant part is not the mental models per se, it's more the framework you should use to leverage them. And these are simply three steps that uh, I use to summarize the framework you should be using. And it's observe, connect, and use, similar to the ones I was using uh, in the Don Draper example. So observe the situation, first of all. Try to understand the basics of it. For instance, is it an acquisition or a retention problem when you are tackling a marketing example? No? Then once you have observed, try to connect. Connect this to a mental model you are familiar with. Connect this with a past experience, with something something you have experienced in the past and might connect you to that similar situation. Connect the dots. And, and you will be knowing a lot more about that situation just by connecting this. And then once you have the model, once you have observed and connected to the model, just go ahead and use it. Don't be afraid of using sometimes what you feel like your gut feeling once when in fact it's not your gut feeling, but your past experience is telling you with more rather a data-informed uh, approach uh, what you should be doing, no? And then once this framework is clear and guys are clear on how you have to use it, 
uh, I think it's important as well to understand some of the mental models you have out there. So uh, there are different resources at the end that you can leverage for these. And if you research online, you will find lots and lots and lots of websites with examples. And as I said before, they are uh, segregated by different archives of topics or thematics. Uh, I would like to highlight two topics that I find to be quite relevant in my experience for product roles. Uh, one is general thinking and the other one is prioritization, such a nice word. So general thinking, I think it's one of those remits that is interesting for the general public as well, of course, but I think that as product management, it's a wide uh, domain. Uh, you have to be mastering different approaches. It's not only limited to what it's product or what is design or what is technology or what is uh, business, right? So I think that uh, englobing all these mental models you need in a role, uh, it's very beneficial for a product management to uh, role to understand the, the, the general thinking ones. And you will learn about the basics of frameworks for faster and better thinking in general. No? So there are mental models that help you get to fa things faster so to understand complex situation faster. And there are others that are for better thinking in general. That is a word that is sometimes misused and maybe in this situation as well. But here are a couple of models that I think I've, uh, could be highlighted. No? So first of all, circle of competence, which consists in being conscious about your blind spots to know what areas of improvement you should invest time in. I think this is a great one for new year resolutions and a great one as well for product managers because we all come from very different backgrounds. For instance, I come from a business background and I'm quite weak in technical uh, in technical skills, for instance. So I think that this mental model helps me in doing this sort of reflection exercise of understanding that I have a blind spot in technical skills and I would like to um, do some kind of um, upskilling in this sense, right? To be up to the level of expectations of my team and as well as my own level of expectations on this. So I think the circle of competence uh, mental model is a very interesting one to be more self-reflecting more on one uh, and another, of course, as well. And then you have the probabilistic thinking. I think this one sounds a bit uh, like two statistics oriented maybe for a product manager that it's not that much coming from the mathematics uh, or statistics background, but this is not that much so oriented to statistics. At the end, it's just consisting on the usage of uh, any type of logic that is at your disposal to estimate the probability uh, of a certain event happening. So this could be, for instance, going back to the example of the decision log. If you have different situations, uh, different scenarios, you might want to try to size them in terms of probability of them happening. So what you will do is you have three scenarios. You use any logic at your disposal to understand scenario one is more feasible or has more numbers of happening than another one. So you might focus more on those ones. So probabilistic thinking, I think it's a quite relevant one. And then from the right side, prioritization, 80-20 uh, rule, it's it's quite magic. And I say magic because I think it's not based on, on magic, but it's, it's quite amazing when you see the results and when you stab it for yourself. So it's based on the Pareto's principle, uh, saying that 80% of the outcomes are decided by 20% of the inputs. Um, and I don't want to tell you more about it because I think it's very interesting if you apply it for yourself and you try to do some analysis on your customer base, for instance, or user base of your products. Try to try to do this kind of segmentation of 20, 80, 80, 20, and try to extract some insights. I think it was quite uh, eye-opening for me when I saw it in the first time. But at the end, a lot of behaviors from the users are explained by 20% of users, explaining 80% of the of the usage of certain features, for instance. So you will extract a lot of uh, very useful insights from, from this one, I'm sure about it. And then I wanted to share something more that maybe you could consider like a, a, a delayed Christmas present, but that's a temp template for decision log, uh, which has helped me a lot in my product roles in the past. Uh, it's just my own interpretation of what would be an, an ideal decision log. So make it yours, adjust it to your organization, your product setting. And as you can see, you will have to detail some background information besides the scenarios. I think that's very beneficial. It, it ensures that everyone has all the information needed. And it's very good to reach consensus with your team as we were discussing before. And super important here, as you see at the bottom of the slide, remember 
value of the model lies in the collaboration with your peers. So it's super important that you share it. It's super important that you gather uh, everyone's feedback and you reach consensus with the team, and you will see the benefits of doing so. So feel free to take it away, uh, adapt it as you see fit, and, and let me know your feedback if you, if you use it. And it's important to have a resource like this one, but it's also important to understand that we have a wide array of resources out there to deep dive a bit more on the mental models concept. So we have, here we have two book proposals. I don't know if book is quite outdated. Now I should be talking about podcasts. I'm sorry about that. I'm quite a classic guy when it comes to learning about things in, in a book format. Uh, but the first book is by Gabriel Weinberg. He's a founder of DuckDuckGo and Lauren McCain. It's called Super Thinking. And I have to tell you, uh, a lot of content from this presentation is coming from this book. It has been a great holiday read, and I would like to uh, encourage you to read it or at least to, to research it online because I think it, it's really good. And it provides this way of thinking that I think a lot of us are looking for, especially coming from people that are so um, oriented towards this kind of product, product development processes or even like the scientific method as, as Lauren is, et cetera. And then we have also the, the one from Farnham Street. Uh, that's a hard one to get, to be honest. I mean, all the time that I've been trying to, to get one, uh, they are always running out of copies, but it's one of those more related to this general kind of mental model, general thinking, rather than more product management or, or kind of digital business oriented. So it's a, it's a one that it's very, 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 very interesting. Uh, and you have to know out there you have endless, endless resources you can research online. You will see Farnham Street has a very cool website as well with other resources. So you might be able to fish out some relevant documentation there. And I think that unfortunately this leaves us uh, with the least last slide. So that's all on mental models. Hope you have found this concept interesting and remember the value of mental models. Uh, and I think if I had to reinforce a couple of lines, I would say value of mental model lies in using them in your daily roles. Don't be afraid of researching the models that you think are best for you. Even if they, if you find them rather basic, we've seen how by following an approach of observing and then identifying some past experience and then leveraging them, you can benefit from having a lot of success in your roles by doing that. So I just wanted to finish by mentioning, as you can see here, that at Farfetch, we are actively hiring for different product roles. Uh, so please get in touch. You have my email here. I would love to get to know and more about you, about what you do in your product roles, if you're interested in Farfetch, and also to discuss anything related to mental models in general. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you, ProSchool, for having me. And I think that we might have some time for questions now. So thank you.